This is tape number three of the Mississippi AF of LCIO convention, Holiday Inn, Jackson, Mississippi. The date is March the 24th, 1976. Have your attention for just a minute. Apparently some of the delegates, maybe I didn't stress the importance of being here at nine o'clock sharp this morning. Perhaps some of them thought we was going to start again at 9.30. I've been advised by the chairman of the elections committee for what it might be worth <coughs> that we want, it won't be necessary to have a runoff election. Now that means that, uh, <coughs> that we will be able to get our business out of the way without too much difficulty before 12 o'clock in my opinion. Since we don't have to have a runoff election, now we know where we are, I'm going to delay opening the convention until it looks like we've got just about everybody in here. Okay? Thank you. Hey, Sergeant at Arms, please get the delegates into the hall. I've checked with the Speaker of the House, and he's got a rather tight schedule, and we're going to have to try to get the convention started in order that he can get back and take care of his business. you set up at CB? Oh. I've been asked to announce, I have your attention please? Brother CB Turner has advised me that they're going to give away the shotgun here in a little while. Those of you that haven't took a chance on that uh, bird gun need to do so before we get started this morning. convention please come to order. As soon as we get this uh, shotgun business uh, out of the way, we're going to get started here this morning. Uh, Brother Tony, if it's all right with you, we're going to afford these folks an opportunity to come outside and fill out one of those tickets. We're going to have a little time here. We won't raffle that thing off until after, until we get the, uh, you know, the convention business put well out of the way. Okay? So anybody that had got a chance on the shotgun, see Brother Turner uh, outside uh, sometime uh, this morning. And... Uh, and buy your ticket. Will the convention please come to order? Ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate this morning to have a friend with us, Reverend Payne from Calvary Baptist Church here in Jackson. Reverend Payne is originally from the Gulf Coast area of our state. He was born and raised in Gulfport. His father owned a business in Jackson County for a number of years. I had the pleasure of meeting him just a few weeks ago when several of you present, along with myself and some other people, were actively working in this area in an effort to get the Democratic Party together 
and most of us were supporting Jimmy Carter for president. Reverend Payne was among that group, and it's interesting to note here this morning, just in passing, that Mr. Carter's doing quite well since he uh, was in our state and since uh, we were out trying to help the gentleman, and it might well be that he might uh, be the next president of the United States. It looks like he's got a pretty good head of steam going for him right now, and it might well be that the man that we will have bringing the invocation this morning might wind up at being a rather influential man with the President of the United States. So with those remarks, it's my pleasure to present to you the Reverend Payne to bring us an invocation. Reverend. Let us pray. Unto thee, O God, the first workman of the universe, the creator of all that is and has been and shall be, we give thanks, both for this day the opportunities of the very present moment when we together under thy guidance and according to the urgings of thy Holy Spirit seek to lead ourselves and our fellow workers and our state to new levels of prosperity and advancement, integrity and honesty and fair play for all people. We thank you for this day and we thank you Lord for what it portends for each of us a new day in our state, a new day for working people. As we gather, we are reminded that our Lord himself knew what honest toil was, that he worked with his hands and was familiar with the saw and with the hammer and with things that were worthy of a man's labor, that his heart was with the working people, that he taught us how to live one with another, that he gave to us an example of generosity and concern and pity and understanding for those who were less fortunate than himself. That he called attention to the plight of those in distress and need about him. That he left examples and teachings concerning how we ought to care one for another. That he said that the laborer was worthy of his hire and that he gave to all of us an example of self-sacrifice and self-giving that stands to this day as the pattern for our lives. Grant unto us, O Father, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that we too may care for those who are hungry and who are naked and who are in distress and who are in prison and who are without the leadership of a father, without the care of a mother. Help us, Lord, to be compassionate people and grant thy blessing upon the meeting of this fine group of working men and women in our state. May we be drawn close to one another in purpose and in unity. May we be drawn close to thee in example and in love and service. Thank you for all that you do for us, and thank you for what you shall do for us in this state and in this nation through the honest labor and efforts of each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Payne. Reverend Payne and his wife were with us last night. Tells me that he really enjoyed being our guest, and his wife especially enjoyed having an opportunity to attend that affair. Are we ready with the next speaker? Would you please bring him in?
very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to have with us this morning the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And for whatever it might be worth, Mr. Newman and delegates, this happens to be the first time in the history of this organization that the Speaker of the House of Representatives has been invited to and will address the convention of this organization. First time, Mr. Speaker. Now, <clears throat> I've been knowing Mr. Newman for many, many years. He's been a member of the House for many years. We haven't always agreed in the past. But I can stand before you here this morning and truthfully say that Mr. Newman has, in the last several years, been very cooperative with me and with some other representatives of the trade union movement in our state. He presently represents the House District comprising of Washington and Issaquena County. The president of our central body, of course, Brother Grantham, is here this morning sitting on the podium. And uh, we've had, uh, you know, uh, quite a discussion with the speaker on several occasions. Now, as he walked in and sat down, he told me that uh, he wasn't accustomed to this kind of treatment, talking about the escort committee that brought him in. I told him, I said, Mr. Speaker, we felt we ought to afford you the same courtesies that we afforded the governor of our state and the lieutenant governor. And nothing wrong with that, he said. After all, Mr. Speaker, many of us think that perhaps you are more powerful in this state than the governor of Mississippi is, you know? And we just think we ought to at least afford you the same courtesies as the governor. I can say to you this morning that since he's been Speaker, he was acting Speaker for, what was it, two years? About a two-year period uh, when the Speaker, when Speaker Junkin was out because of illness, he was elected on his own this last time, so he has served as speaker now for roughly, I'd say, two and a half, not quite two and a half years. Been around the legislature a number of years, as most of you know. I've seen a lot of uh, sessions of the legislature. And I say to you this morning, in all candor, that Buddy Newman runs a good ship. He's a good speaker. The House of Representatives as a working organization. A lot of people think that they come up here and spend a lot of your tax money and don't accomplish anything. But I say to you this morning on his leadership that we do have a hard-working House of Representatives, and it's my pleasure to present to you at this time, Speaker of the House, that's Scandal Burger, C.B. Buddy Newman. Thank you. I was telling Claude I really am not used to this kind of treatment, and furthermore, I'm not used to this kind of uh, introduction. We in the legislature are modest people, and we don't like the word powerful. I would rather that he had introduced me as a member serving in a responsible position. The members of the news media disagree with us, of course. How many of you have enjoyed this convention? Now, I know all of you went to bed early last night. I know you didn't stay out on the town, and I know you, you're feeling great this morning, and you want me to talk for just about one hour. And I'm sure that none of you will go to sleep. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it would be repetitious if I stood here today to try to give you a legislative report. I'm sure that Mr. Ramsey and the other officials of your organization keep you informed on what we do in the legislature. I would like to talk to you this morning for just about five or six minutes on something that I feel very deeply in my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, the pioneer spirit of America still lives and breathes in the hearts and minds of the vast majority of the people of our nation. It is persons like you gathered in this assembly who are responsible for preserving the pioneer spirit of our country. Because of your patriotism, your courage, and your belief in America 
and our institutions, the flame of freedom still burns brightly from the Mexican Gulf to the shores of Maine, from Mississippi to the Pacific Northwest, from California to the Great Lakes, from the green hills of Virginia to the vast plains of the West. Yes, in every nook and cranny of our beautiful country. You and your cohort, more than any other group, are responsible for preserving our free enterprise system that has provided our people with a bountiful and abundant, uh, an abundant life far surpassing that of any people of any nation in the entire history of mankind. The course our nation has followed for 200 years has not been an easy one, nor is there any guarantee the future will differ greatly from the past. But then freedom is never easy. It is easily lost, easily curtailed, easily surrendered, but never easily gained. What price freedom? It cost a bunker hill, a valley forge, an Oregon forest, an Omaha beach, a Guadalcanal, Canal, a return to the Philippines, a Korea, a Vietnam. It cost son, brother, father. It cost sacrifice. And it will continue to cost, but never more than it is worth. Today we find ourselves in another battle to protect our freedom against an enemy more dangerous than ever before. Today's enemy is called doubt. We doubt our courage to fulfill our commitments to our friends in the free world. We doubt our public officials. We doubt our young. We doubt our laws and those who enforce them. We let ourselves be told that America is not the same young, strong giant we once knew. We hear that our resources are drained away, our currency devoid of true value, our moral fiber torn and tattered. We hear the song of woe from the prophets of doom every day. To them I say, listen. Listen to the children sing, children free of polio, diphtheria, malnutrition, children with hope living in a country they love. Listen to our aged, safe and secure in the land they built, with the best housing, the best health care, the most secure future elderly people have ever known. Listen to the American laborer, hard working, God fearing, independent and strong. Hear his hammer ring. It tolls the song of liberty. Listen to the American astronaut who stands on the moon and quietly prays to his God for all the people on earth. We, ne we need not fear for America as we approach our 200th birthday. America is strong. America is brave. America is free. So has it been, so shall it be. Let us on this occasion and every day of our lives look back with pride and forward without fear or doubt. For in our hearts we know, as it said in the carol, the wrong shall fail, the right prevail. The spirit of America will continue so long as we have faith in each other and in the guiding hand of the Almighty. As we assemble here during this bicentennial year, a year of great significance, let the word go forth that among all our citizens there is a rededication of those principles of the representative form of government that has made this country great. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, think with me a minute and look about you as you move from place to place in our state and nation. 
Observe the true beauty of our forests, fields, streams, and factories. Be proud of our ancestors. Be proud of yourselves and your neighbors and the contribution that you are making to those things that are good and decent for all of our citizens. Working together, we can surely provide for a golden dawn and a greater day for all Mississippians and Americans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We appreciate your presence here very much. We wish you could stay around and spend the day with us, but I know how busy you are. Incidentally, we do have a couple of months for your house over here observing what you're saying. Yeah, I'm I know you didn't say anything good. about money or anything like that. No, we don't take care of the taxes. <laughs> good, appreciate it. a slight delay while the next committee gets organized to bring in the next speaker. Some of them are having to serve on two or three escort committees. We have to get them, let them get out and get organized to come back. <laughs> about it out there, I'll see if the next uh, speaker's here and if they're ready to bring him in. Mary, stick your head out, see if they're ready. I think it was. Yeah, well, well, I'll try to check that. Are we ready out there? We wait for about a half a minute. Dan Ory handed me a <coughs> list of the Senate Insurance Committee. I thought that was supposed to have been passed out yesterday. Did you get that yesterday? Here we are. Come on in. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday we had several speakers, at least two, made a reference to the sorry voting record of most of our congressional delegation in the Congress of the United States. One of those gentlemen from the 5th Congressional District, named Trent Lott, Republican, was elected to the Congress a few years ago <coughs> by riding the coattails of Richard Nixon in the office. Just so happened that the incumbent, Bill Carmer, stepped down and retired. His executive assistant decided he wanted the job. And instead of running as a Democrat, he decided to run as a Republican. And unfortunately, at the same time, we had a number of very good friends that sought the Democratic nomination. Ben Stone being the winner of the primary. Well, now, you know, as the record indicates, Ben Stone lost that election to Trent Lott, we think, 
We think one of the major causes centered around the fact that we had too many good people seeking the Democratic nomination. They chewed each other up pretty bad in the primary. Trent Lott come along and picked up all of the marbles. That's how the gentleman was elected to Congress. Now we have with us this morning, young man, it's starting his second term in the House of Representatives from Harrison County. Very progressive-minded young man. I consider, him as, I consider him as being one of the most progressive-minded members of either house. He decided recently that he was going to run for the Congress of the United States from the 5th District this time as a Democrat. Next week will be the deadline for quantifying. All of us are hopeful, of course, Gerald, that uh, you don't have any opposition in the primary of course, we have a little procedure to go through where we have to, uh, and don't, where, you know, in order to endorse a candidate. But if things work out good, if the people in that fifth district decide they want to get behind Gerald Blessy, then you can be assured that the state organization is going to do everything that we can to help Gerald Blessy. So it's my pleasure at this time to present to you Representative Gerald Blessy from Harrison County. Mr. Blessing. Claude Ramsey, <clears throat> Reverend Payne, brothers and sisters of the Escort Committee, ladies and gentlemen. Speaking to this assembly is an unparalleled honor for me as the son and grandson of a union member. My dad was a letter carrier for over 30 years. My grandfather was a charter member of the old Carpenters Union on the Gulf Coast. In the efforts of their unions, I'm convinced, to increase wages and job security gave my family that little bit extra that enabled me to go to law school and to stand before you today. My dad is now retired and is selling real estate part-time, and his slogan is, in his real estate business is really cut out for Cal Cogsville. You know, Cal is a newlywed down there with a Sarah and Cal are uh, uh, still on the honeymoon, I think, and my dad gave him a ring and said his slogan is, get a lot while you're young. <laughs> Cal is uh, going to take him up on that, and uh, we've been having a lot of fun down the Gulf Coast, uh, electing and helping elect uh, progressive legislators. But with the help of good people like Cal and Sarah Cogsdale, I believe that we can begin electing progressive congressmen from the 5th District of Mississippi. Many of the pocketbook issues which plagued my father and grandfather when they were my age of 33 now plague us all again. Let me remind you of the tremendous sugar shortage. You will recall in history that it occurred at the turn of the century under Republican leadership. And it has occurred again just a year ago under the present Republican leadership. But once this shortage saw the price of sugar reach $3 for five pounds, you could buy all the sugar you needed, and the shortage disappeared. Then there was the gasoline shortage, when the American people were told they would only be able to gas up their automobiles once a week. In long lines, all of us formed at each service station. But once the Republican administration saw gasoline reach 65 cents a gallon, you could buy as much gasoline as you needed, and the shortage disappeared. Then we had the great bread shortage. When people rushed the bread counties just a few months ago at all supermarkets, while at the same time our Republican friends in Washington were selling millions of bushels a week to Russia on credit. Then came the turn for the power company and the electric bill. When the Republicans took office in Washington over eight years ago, the cost of electricity was within the means of every working family. But now many people pay more for their monthly light bill than they do for their mortgage. Yet the Southern Company, which is the parent holding company of Mississippi Power Company, last year reported an 88% increase in net profit. And Middle South Utility, the parent company of Mississippi Power and Light, reported in 74 to the Public Service Commission new highs in income and earnings per share of stock. 
I think the working family can't stand any more of this Republican prosperity. We cannot continue to pay luxury prices for the necessities of life. Yet while we sit here, over 500 natural gas wells are capped at the wellhead in the Gulf of Mexico under the present administration's policy because the companies that own these wells say that they cannot make their desired profit, yet they tell us there's a shortage of natural gas. And vast deposits of coal remain embedded in the mountains of West Virginia and Pennsylvania because our leaders in Washington have failed to promote sufficient incentives to mine this coal. Now I believe the pocketbook of every working family demands and deserves relief from this energy problem. This relief will come only when we have leaders in Washington with the vision and determination to forge a national energy policy that will serve us not just until the next election, but for the next generation as well. I propose that we set a new national goal to counter the energy problem in the next decade. Just as President Roosevelt established the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb, and just as President Kennedy launched the space program to put us on the moon in 10 years, we need new democratic leaders who will establish an energy program that will bring together the best scientists, the best minds, the best engineers in our nation to concentrate their efforts on solving this energy problem. I believe we can do it, and I believe we must try. I believe it takes democratic leadership to put that kind of program together. Specifically, in the short run, we should reopen all of the coal fields, putting thousands of men and women back to work in those areas, and putting scientists and engineers on the job immediately to developing the cheaper ways of desulfurizing this coal so it can be burned in our large cities as well as a feasible way of gasifying the coal so we can put it back into the gas lands that the Republicans claim uh, cannot be used for natural gas anymore. Likewise, we should open all available oil and gas fields. There are many oil fields, believe it or not, right here in the state of Mississippi that are not pumping oil because under the National Republican Administration's policy, they call it old oil and therefore, for some reason, it can't be sold at a profit. We should open these oil and gas fields, except those needed for tr strategic reserves for our military forces, and then these fossil fuels in the immediate future should be delivered to our houses, our homes and factories and businesses at non-inflationary prices until that team of scientists that we should get together can develop alternate sources of energy. And then for the long run, we should concentrate on development of solar energy of thermal energy in the ground, of ocean energy from the different temperature layers in the seawater, and of safer nuclear energy such as nuclear fusion. That should be our goal as a national Democratic Party and as a people in the Congress and in the White House. Now, some say or may ask, why give so much attention to energy problems at a labor convention? And of course, it is true that there are many other issues which concern working men and women, inflation, health care, unemployment, tax reform, education, equal opportunity, job safety, and decent housing, among others, concern us all greatly. But I submit to you that the cost of fuel under eight years of Republican mismanagement is chiefly responsible for inflation and unemployment, and the energy problem must be solved if we are to deal effectively with these other issues that affect our standard of living and the quality of life. These days, the pocketbook is emptied at the fuel pump. And every recent gain in wages has been eaten up by inflated fuel costs, which have raised the price of refrigerators and other such goods almost as much as it has raised the cost of the electricity to run them. I think it is time to return aggressive, innovative, democratic leadership to the Congress, to the White House, to get this country moving again. Whether we view the energy problem or decay in the cities or the neglect of the countryside at every turn, we see at the base of these problems the failure of the Republicans in Washington to lead. And that failure was recently illustrated by the head of the Farmers Home Administration in Mississippi, a Republican appointee 
who lost last year $19 million in home building loans available to Mississippians. And when asked recently why this money was retained by his National Republican administration, he replied that his staff in Mississippi was giving greater emphasis to servicing loans than to processing new applications. In common sense terms, this means that Republicans are more interested in collecting rent than in building new houses. And that is wrong, wrong, wrong. This, back, this is backwards in, in policy and it is backwards in, in the law. And we should see that it has changed. You who are in the home building construction trades should be as serious about this Republican neglect as are the owners of the home building companies you work for. Because this money lost in Mississippi is money and jobs lost in Mississippi. And I submit to you that Democratic leadership in Congress would not have stood for such failure by a Democratic appointee. And I hope you will join me in protesting this inaction. We must resume the forward movement toward a better life for all Americans. And crucial to that forward movement, to the improvement of the quality of life, is housing available to all at a cost all can afford. We have not had such a policy since the last Democratic president was in office, and it is not likely we will see it again until we have a new Democratic president and a new Democratic Congress. A great general once said to his gardener to plant a tree tomorrow in his garden, and the gardener replied that it was no use because the, the tree would not bloom for 100 years. In that case, said the general, I suggest you plant it this afternoon. We have a long season of difficulty ahead in this nation. If we are to solve these great problems of energy, unemployment, tax reform, and all the rest, I suggest that we start planning, not this afternoon, but this morning, tomorrow, and every day until we can get new spokesmen in Washington to speak for the working men and women of this nation. A new day is dawning in our land, and it rises in a southern sky. Our southern climate, our southern resources, our southern workforce, and our strong historic sense of value for the special worth of each individual are all combining to make the New South the cradle of America's rebirth. In this great birthday year, we find southern leaders, southern politicians, if you will, are rising to rekindle the flames lit 200 years ago. We find Southern Democrats arising to give strong voices to the progressive mainstream of America where unity and common sense mean common progress for all. Won't you join in this historic effort to lead from the South throughout the nation to place your hands and your minds and your hearts and your voices into this rebirth of our great American spirit? Won't you join in that effort? Waiting for the <coughs> next speaker for the committee to get organized outside. I see a couple of legislators sitting in the audience out there. Uh, Representative Bowburn from Adams County and J.W. Rainey from Hines County. Stand up, let them see you, gentlemen. Glad to have both of you here this morning. <laughs> now, 
I can't see too good back there. Do we have any other guests that need to be introduced? I'm going to ask about the Senate Insurance Committee. Have all of you got this document yet, the list of the Insurance Committee, Senate Insurance Committee? You don't have it? All right, we're going to ask them to go ahead and scatter it around a little bit. And I wanted to get this out before last night, but better to have it late than never. Some of you might still have an opportunity to talk to these people. Yeah, go ahead and start getting it out. Turn it up a little. Maybe I'm not quite close enough to it. Is that better? Okay. <clears throat> Are you ready? With, okay, bring in the next speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you know, I think, that I was elected president of the state of FLC all of the first time in 1959. And it was during the 1960 session of the legislature that we got worked over rather severely during the 1960 session during the administration of Governor Ross Barnett. It was during that session that the right to work law was placed in our state's constitution. We only had a handful of friends in that legislature. My memory serves me right. Uh, only about 12 or 13 had voted against that proposition. Don't remember the exact count. I think we had seven votes against it in the Senate. I forget the exact count in the House. But Ed Jolly from Meridian, Mississippi, who is a member of a local union, works for Flint Coat and Meridian, who has been a president of his local union. Ed Jolly was a member of that session of the legislature been there several terms. He was appointed as vice chairman of the House Labor Committee by Speaker Newman recently, before this, well, right after this session convened. We had hoped that the Speaker would appoint Ed Jolly as chairman of that committee, but for reasons of his own, and I think I know why, he elected not to do so. Now, we have invited Ed Jolly here this morning for several reasons, of course. Number one, he's a very good friend of ours. Number two, he's a member of a labor organization. He understands many of our problems much better than a lot of other people. But we've invited him here today for another reason. We wanted him to have an opportunity to address this convention and kind of assess the situation as he sees it in the House of Representatives. Some people don't think we're in too good a shape, but I think we're in the best shape we've ever been. But the man that I'm about to bring before you next is in a much better position to assess that situation than I am. So it is a great pleasure for me this morning to introduce to you Representative Ed Jolly from Lauderdale County. Mr. Jolly. Thank 
you, Claude. The other members, distinguished members, the brothers and sisters of the labor. I am a dues-paying member of a local back home. I get a leave of absence every year to come over here and serve at the legislature. When I leave this session, I'll go back into the plant and work as I will have paid. I feel real proud to know that I am the only member of the House that is truly a working man. Our present governor, Cliff Finch, that you elected, stole my campaign slogan, the working man. When I first run for the legislature, <coughs> let me go back a little further. I want to bring you into it. My first reason for running to the legislature, I came over here as a delegate from my local, interested in a bill that affected labor. And I couldn't even get anybody hardly to talk to me. The only ones I got to talk to me want to know how much money I had, which I was as broke as some of y'all are out there. I still am. But to me, it, 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 it upset me. I went back home, and that was in 1959. And I told my local, I said, if you'll back me and help get labor's backing, I'll run on a labor ticket as a working man. If you'll send me over there, I'll assure you I hope to stay there till someday that I'll see labor recognized. And I hope I'll be a part of it. And thank God I have. Back when I first come here, I think Claude well remembers it. They had a labor banquet. And to my recollection, there were three people from the legislature at that banquet. Those three people, some of you in the audience remember, was Claude Wiesenberg, Nadie Carraway, and myself. I think Claude well remembers. The others were ashamed to come before labor. The only way they'd speak to them was in some side place where nobody could see him. Ever since I've been here, I've been proud to be associated with organized labor. Organized labor has put me back here every time, except one time. And this is something I'm gonna tell you, don't y'all ever sit down and think you got it made over here with the legislature. One time I thought I had it made all the people back home thought I had it made, and I sat down, and a woman beat me. <laughs> Four years, I was red-shirted. I sat on the sidelines and come over here and talk to the legislature. But I'll go back, and I want to say, if Claude or Red Ferguson, I think some of you remember, come try to talk to the legislature, they would get away from them just as quick as they could, afraid the camera would catch them with it. Labor wasn't strong then. Last night I saw something that I said back to my wife when she kept telling me it wasn't worth being in. If any of you ever decide to run for the legislature, don't run for it for money, because it's not there. But she made the statement, I wish she was here to see the banquet last night. I wish she was here to see the governor Lieutenant Governor, Speaker of the House, Speaker Pro Tem of the Senate, and the big crowd that was here last night from your legislature wasn't ashamed to come up here and be associated with you. Back when I first come here, labor was a dirty word. And I was labor's boy when I come over here. And they had shown me every way I went. 
anything I wanted, they'd shot me. And you sitting right out there in the audience have changed it. You've changed it where you had, I'd say, four-fifths of the legislature sitting up here last night eating with you. You have changed it. Sometimes when you sit back and criticize Claude, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Claude and Tom Knight for something that you don't agree with them up here, you sit and think what you're doing. Claude and Tom and others over here, I'm, I'm just naming them because they're hitting it, are over here busy at all times. And Claude and Tom and others before them helped make it to where you had the governor, the lieutenant governor, speaker of the house, speaker pro tem of the Senate, to speak to you for the first time in history. I want you to stop and think how far you come. You know that cigarette says, baby, you come a long way, and you have. You have by your help with Claude. Claude hadn't done it all. When it comes time for elections in your area, if you've got somebody in there that don't recognize a working man, you can elect a new one. You don't have to put money in it. Just get out there and talk to one. And don't say he's been there too long. If he's still serving you as a working class of people, put him back again. That's where he begins to get his power after he comes back year after year until he gets some seniority. That first four years, he's crawling like a baby. He's trying to get his feet on the floor where he can walk. But I'm saying to you, you are strong. You're the word union. Together, over here, you can get anything past you want. Don't sit back and say, Claude and Tom and them are going to do it over here because they are meeting with us. You sit down. You sit down and you write your legislature a letter. Or either you call him or you contact him at home or down here. And you'd be surprised what six letters would do for that legislature over here. Six, not, not chain letters, personal letters. You can change anything in that legislature by election. You can change anything by backing Claude and them over here by writing those letters for the things you're interested in over here. Don't sit back and say, Claude's going to do it. I, I, there's no need of me doing it. You sit there and write that letter. You write it. You talk to your legislature. They're not ashamed to talk to you now. They were back when I first come in. They'll talk to you now, and if you don't believe it, you try it. And you can get across to them what you want as a working class of people. As I've often said, all the working class people want is a fair shake. And thank God they're coming closer to getting it now than they ever have. If y'all will stand together and work for the working class of people what you think you want and what you want. Don't let Claude sit up here and do it by himself. Don't let Tom Knight sit up here and do it by himself. Don't let the people in your local area do it by themselves, like L.D. Clark and my local area and others. You get up there and help them. And not only that, you get out and circulate with the, the ones when you go back home with your union members and talk with them. And you can further this thing. Well, not only this time you elected a governor and a lieutenant governor, but you can elect all the legislature. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>
this good friend of ours. And we hope, Ed, the next session, just kind of put you on notice now. We'll be talking to the speaker before long about the next session. Some of our people are a little bit upset and concerned over the fact that the House Labor Committee didn't meet during this session. And I advise those people that we felt it would be more appropriate to wait for the next session of the legislature to see what can be done about legislation establishing the State Department of Labor. We've had some conversations with the governor, some of his staff people, considering the fact that the first session of a new administration is looked upon as the governor's session, considering the fact that you have all kinds of deadlines to meet, <coughs> we felt it would be more appropriate to wait until the next session to go after that particular piece of legislation. <coughs> Therefore, we did not call upon the speaker about using his influence to call Mr. N cause Mr. Neblett, chairman of that committee, to call a meeting of that session and bring out that particular piece of legislation. But Ed, I want to tell you here this morning that you can get ready, friend, because before the next session gets here, we intend to do everything that we can, exercise our influence with the speaker and other folks, See if we can't get a good Department of Labor bill out before the House. Now, I'm convinced myself here this morning that if we can get such a piece of legislation out of committee, get it on the calendar, that we have enough votes in both houses to pass it. I just wanted to put Ed Jolly on notice. This is what our plans are, and not to throw up his hands and and just Gust or get uh, discouraged over the fact that uh, that committee that he's vice chairman of did meet this time. Friend, we hope to see them get together next time, but soon. Thank you very much, Ed. Now, while <coughs> this committee is leaving the podium, I want to request that Steve Williams and all of the international representatives that are present here this morning to come to the podium, please. Come right over here with Nick Zonnery. That's where I want you. All of the international representatives that are present here this morning, organizers and what have you. Where's Ray Smith on? I saw him back there this morning. What'd you say? Check your head out there and see if we got any. There he is, John Gillespie. Come on in here. I didn't put him on notice on what I wanted them to do this morning, but uh, we're going to ask them to come up with our next speaker. So we're going to have a slight pause here while we look the quarter over and see if we got any other representatives outside. So I think we need to have them in here. Where's Tom? Tom's available. I'd like to have him up here too this morning. See if you can. He was there a minute ago. Wait for Tom. I'd like for Tom to be here on the podium with the next speaker also. Yeah, I saw him here. I had somebody step up and get him. Jim, come on up here with this group. Where is, is Dan Ori in the house? There he is. Come on, Dan. I'd like to have you and Tom both in on this. All right, uh, Tom, I want you to bring him. Okay. Yeah, come on in. Bring him on up. Nick? We just... Come on up here, Ray. We'd like to have you in on this. Ray Smith Hart. Come on, Ray.
Now, we're not putting on all that much of a show yet this time because the man that we're about to bring on next is one of us. But I did want some people up here on this podium that were involved in this thing known as organizing. Ladies and gentlemen, I think all of you are aware of the fact that a couple of years ago, we, the executive board of this organization, felt that it would be most appropriate to request of the Industrial Union Department that they establish a coordinated organizing program in the state of Mississippi. We consequently contacted Nick Zonerick, the director of organization for the Industrial Union Department, about such a project. Steve Williams, who <coughs> was with the Industrial Union Department at that time, met with our board and talked about this type of a program. To make a long story short, the Industrial Union Department came into Mississippi established the program, rented office space, and opened up for business in the city of Tupelo. Unfortunately, shortly after that program was initiated, we went into this so-called Ford-Nixon prosperity period where we had a lot of unemployed workers. Had we got this program started about two years sooner, in my opinion, most of the unorganized plants in this area of the state would have been organized today. A lot of interest up there when we asked Nick Zonrick, Industrial Union Department, to come into Mississippi and open up that program. But when we started to have a lot of unemployment, a lot of people seeking work, then the job of organizing workers became more severe, virtually impossible in some situations. Now, I'm sure that all of you here this morning recognize the fact that you would be here yourself had someone not, in the past, initiated an organizing program in the plant or the place in which you work. Now, I consider organizing the unorganized workers of our state <coughs> as being the major unfinished business of the labor movement in Mississippi. If we're to do the proper job, if our objectives are to be obtained, and if we're to be successful in the political arena, elect friends to office, then organizing the unorganized workers of our state is top priority. The man we have with us this morning has been here for the entire convention. He came in here Sunday night before some of you did. He's been with us through all of our sessions. And I think that he has enjoyed this convention been in the slave movement for a long time. He's helped organize a lot of workers. But this is the first time that he will have had the opportunity to have addressed the convention. He was with us the last one. But Mr. Abel, the president of the Industrial Union Department, delivered that address, and he sat there and listened to what his boss had to say. Now, I could say much about Nick Zonerick, but I'd be infringing upon his time. It is my pleasure at this time to present to you Brother Nick Zonrick, Director of Organization for the Industrial Union Department. Brother Zonrick. President Ramsey, uh, officers, distinguished guests and delegates to this convention. I am indeed uh, <coughs> privileged to be at this convention at the invitation of 
President Ramsey. And at the outset here this morning, uh, Ramsey, I'm glad that you've seen fit that you invited my associates up here to give me some moral support. I get lonesome up here myself. <clears throat> yes, I came in here Sunday night, and uh, I came here for a profound purpose. And that is that we do have organizing programs in this mid-southern area. And I thought it would give me an opportunity to meet with my own coordinator, Bob Corley, and some of his staff, and talk to some of the delegates of the various unions, and make some new acquaintance of new delegates whom I have never met before, all directed in the direction of trying to create and inspire a little more interest in this organizing program. So I must say, uh, President Ramsey, that this convention to me has been rather more informative than any convention I've ever attended. And I must say to the delegates here that I haven't seen a convention that has been more attentive than the delegates to this convention. And above all, it has been a most constructive convention. And I don't know of two officers of any organization, be they of state organization or international union. I don't know of two officers that make a better team and who have their thumb on the pulse beat of the needs of the people in this great state of Mississippi and to implement the program that's directed by this convention and the constitution of this convention or the AFL-CIO of this state other than Claude Ramsey and Tom Knight. <laughs> well, I bring you greetings from President Abel of the Industrial Union Department and all the officers of the Industrial Union Department. I have a warm feeling to be here and I'm privileged to be here in order to look in on this convention and observe this convention. As I told Claude Ramsey last night, I've got something to go back to report to my officers when I get back. You know, the labor movement has been concerned about this great state of Mississippi and well aware of the difficult problems and the tasks that's before you. Yes, it's been said, you know, that people in this state are somewhat the forgotten people because of low wages and whatnot. Sometimes I look back and I think that perhaps maybe even a labor movement hasn't given enough input to the state federation here of this state that perhaps it should have given. But I suppose there's reason for it. You know, I find that in every area in the organizing effort, that where there is a tough area and the climate is not conducive to organizing, it is somewhat difficult to inspire organizations to get into the act and do something for the forgotten people. But I am happy that President Ramsey and Tom Knight and your executive board, that they have been very perseverant and never gave up, that a better day will dawn. Yes, I came here with Steve Williams here a couple of years ago, perhaps maybe even three years ago, Claude. We talked about organizing. Claude had his eyes sights set on that new industry has been coming into this state for the past 10, 12 years. And he says, Zonerich, you know, 
The labor movement isn't doing very much to organize the new industry. And we've got to get something moving here in this area. If we want to strengthen our position in the area of political action and promoting social legislation for the betterment of all people in this state and to protect economic security, and this is how we come into the act. Well, the day I was leaving, Claude, you know, I had some three hours to wait for my plane. And I went over here to the YMCA. You know, I'm one of these guys that tries to uh, keep this frame of mind, perhaps not in good shape, but in good condition. So I had some three hours. I spent a couple hours over there at the YMCA. So I met a gentleman there from the business community here, and he says to me, he introduced himself, and I did, and he said, you know, I'm sure glad to see you all come down here and visit with us. Well, I said, I'm glad to be here. Then finally, you know, we got talking about the weather and the climate and all the surroundings of this great state, what a nice place to live, new industry coming in. And as I was ready, ready to leave the Y, get my clothes on. He says, by the way, he says, you did tell me that you're from Washington. I said, that's right. Well, he said, you must be a politician. He said, no, I'm not a politician. Well, then he said, you must be a government man. No, I said, I'm not a government man. Well, he said, I don't know what you are. But I said, I'll tell you what I am. I happen to represent the AFL-CIO. Well, what are you doing here? Well, I said, you know, we're talking about this new industry, and you know, there's low wages here, and I think that the economic lot in this great state has to be improved for the people. So we're going to put on an organizing program and organize this industry. And he said, Lord have mercy. <laughs> well, you know, I... I've had the privilege, you know, in the labor movement to be in Mississippi a number of times and all through the South in over 40 years in organizing workers. And this state of Mississippi I looked upon as one of the states that is not in the United States. Yes, I was down here in the march with Martin Luther King and Walter Ruther back here some years ago. I don't remember when that was, Claude, 67 or 68, somewhere in there, maybe 66. And you know, I'm happy to say that the tone of this convention and the distinguished guests that you have had here at this convention there's been remarkable change reported by your officers and changes have been taken place and remarkable changes have taken place. Yesterday, you know, you had a most gracious, a most distinguished lady, Evelyn Gandy, the lieutenant governor of this state, and you know, I think she has her eyes on the ball. She knows what she is talking about. She has talked about this new industry. She's talked about bringing industry in here, the blue chip industry, an industry that perhaps will pay better wages, higher wages. She talked about Mississippians ought to get involved in more industry. She talked about that finance and profit that is made by these corporations should be in the financial institutions of banks in this state. And you know, as you just stop and think about it, she has said a whole lot. That means if there's more money here made from profits by these corporations, that perhaps there'll be greater opportunity for working people to have reasonable loans from the banks to build homes and for financier me. So this, this lady is really on the ball. 
Well, you know, I had a lot to say here, and I've got a lot of papers here, but I thought this morning, Claude, that I would try and comport myself to the tone of this convention. The opening day of this convention, you had a most distinguished citizen address this convention. He came on like a bulldozer operator, like a milkman, <laughs> like a laborer and picking a shovel man in the labor game. And I talk about no other than the Honorable Governor of the State of Mississippi. Well, you know, he had some nice things to say about you and about the state AFL-CIO here in this state. I just want to recap some of the things that he said, not all of them. But the first thing he said, this organization has grown to become the largest organized economic group in our state. Now that comes from the government. In addition, your work towards making Mississippi a more attractive place for industry, this organization vigorously supports changes that would be beneficial to all the people of this state. And he said, I want to urge you to continue your involvement, and I want you to continue supporting the improvements in our education system. Continue your efforts to make your government more efficient. Continue working for more equitable tax laws. I want you as representatives of our working people to continue to be an active participant in our government. This, by and large, has been said many times by officials in your state organization. And I have had to just re recap on these items. Well, he also said that the history of the American labor movement shows why a group of employees with common needs and common goals can do when they join hands and work together. Through a common effort, through collective bargaining, labor has been able to contribute substantially to improving the standards of living for all workers across this country. We in the labor movement couldn't say it any better even though we have. He said he believes that a similar effort by all people of Mississippi would do the state <clears throat> will do good for, for this state. And I believe that our United Democratic Party, well, I don't have to say that. I'm trying to skip over some of this. He said, we now have a vehicle to marshal full potential, our greatest resource of our people towards making the changes we need to get our state off of the bottom. Yeah, he said... It is sad, but indeed true. No matter how much we hate to admit it, but we are 50th on our nation's economic ladder. However, we don't have to be. We have the resources, both natural and human, talking about the working people, to be at least in the top 20 through a united effort by all of us, joining hands and working together for the common good, we can convert this potential greatness into actuality. That's our goal in the labor movement. Then he said, we are working to create a more and better paying jobs for our people. And he made it very clear, from now on, when we seek out new industries, cheap labor will not be a selling point. Well, you know, 
I think those are the most greatest remarks that he had made. Well, you know, not only Mississippi is low on the totem pole and the bottom step of the ladder, but there are other states through this great South. You know, he's organizing a program over in South Carolina back in 1963. And when we went into South Carolina, there were unions in the AFL-CIO and the Industrial Union Department had some objection in going into the state of South Carolina. They said, you can't go into South Carolina, it's a lost cause. Over the years, we haven't been able to organize a single plant in South Carolina. I said, that's why we're going in there. New industry coming into South Carolina, and I don't know what we've got to lose except everything to gain. Well, we were successful in organizing several plants in South Carolina, and, and the only workers organized there up at that time was none other than some of the building trades. Well, you know, there was a German concern that came from Germany and built this steel mill in Georgetown, South Carolina. A sort of a real modern, mini, basic steel industry to compete, to compete with the steel industry. So we set out to organize this steel plant. And lo and behold, to my surprise, that we even had people in the steel workers who said that you can't do it, Zonerich. Well, I said, I'll tell you what. If you don't want it, we're going to go ahead anyway. How did this industry come into South Carolina from Germany? Well, they done a very stupid thing. They came over there and they glanced at the countryside in the great state of South Carolina. You know, just like you see over here in the lobby. You see that little television program they got there? They show all the nice things about this great state and true educational institutions, cultural in institutions, recreational grounds, playgrounds, tennis courts, golf courses, and whatnot. Well, this great company from Germany comes to South Carolina, and the would-be people in that great community of Georgetown, they sold them on the idea that there are great resources in this great area of South Carolina, human resources at cheap prices. And this, this great president of the Georgetown Steel Company, he makes an announcement to the press with his picture in the paper. And the press asked him, why did you come here? Well, we come here because this climate here is conducive, and you've got a lot of people here that need jobs, and there are no unions in the state, and labor is cheap, and that's why we came here. Well, we served notice on Mr. Wolfgang. He's the president of the company. And we left him know that we're not going to permit Germans to come into the United States and perpetuate misery. And I'm happy to say, you know, that they are organized today under a good collective bargaining contract that meets the terms that we have in a basic steel industry. So I merely make reference to that that we don't want to be criticizing what we have to say about low wages and low on a totem pole as far as the economy of this state is concerned. We've got a lot of Mississippis down through this belt in this southern, southern part of the country. Well, the governor also said in closing that I want to assure you that working people you represent will be the center of the attention of this administration. And boy, I know you're going to make use of that. We want our government to be not only responsive, but also effective of the working men and women who for too long have been forgotten by our government. Now, that's a lot of 
real spicy, pertinent words. Well, he also said, our people are productive, hardworking and dedicated to helping their fellow man. Our government must likewise be productive, hardworking, and be dedicated to the welfare of our citizens. And you can play a great role in making sure that your government is responsive and reflective of the character of our people. As governor, I need your help and your advice. Well, Claude, you know, this demonstrates the effectiveness of this state organization and what you've been doing here. Now, there's a, all the good things that the governor had to say about you, we've got to add a little bit more to it. There are reasons for low wages in the state of Mississippi. You know, you have a promoting organization, or has been, and maybe it's changed now by the tone of the government's remarks it has. You had an organization, I saw some booklet was put out, I think by the Agricultural Institution or whatever it's called, and that organization was hell-bent in bringing new industry. And you know, I must salute them that they've done a very good job. A lot of new industry has been constructed in this state and all to the good. And I want to give them due consideration that perhaps their intentions were well thought of, that we need industry in here to spirit this economy and provide employment for our able-bodied working men and women. But they also, like Georgetown Steel, assured these corporations of the great places in this state and the cultural institutions and educational institutions that they had underway. That you come in here and we can assure you, you know, that you're not going to be bothered by organizers and organizing this industry, and these people came in here. Now, you know, some of this industry that comes in here, or most of them, they're not bad people. They're gentlemen. They must have some technical know-how and some technical ability, or they wouldn't have taken advantage of this great location in the United States here in Mississippi. But we must, must remember that they are in business to make a buck and they're interested in making profits. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. The only thing that is wrong with it, how long is their working men and women going to put up with it and work for low wages? Well, you know, there may be other reasons that they give, you know, when some of you organize a plant you get at the bargaining table when you're asking for more money. They have all kinds of reasons to try and justify why they can't give you a wage increase or a very small one or other improvement. They talk about competition. They, they talk about the geographical area, wage rates and so forth. And really what they mean, they don't want to upset the economy. Well, of all the factors that can be analyzed, in they trying to justify low wages, and I'm talking about the industry. There are only two, in my opinion, that are most important. And those two factors are this. The lack of unionization in the state and the right to work law. These two have most important influence on wages and the bargaining process at the bargaining table. The significant impact of the right to work law, the influence of legislation by statute, it has the impact that produces the lowest wage rate 
wherever these laws are in these United States. Well, departing from that a little bit, you know, let's talk about some other things here. You know, I had a little meeting with the teachers yesterday. And you know, one of the teachers told me that in some of the schools in this state, Tell me about their condition. I won't relate all of them. But anyway, I asked them what the minimum wage was for teachers. Well, this one uh, distinguished lady tells me that it's $7,200 for beginning. Now, this is a professional class. I have two school teachers, two daughters. And you know, I look forward that my daughter as a teacher will go into the classroom with a purpose to understand this free system of ours, to understand the meaning of democracy, and that she will have some influence to expand the, tech the, the technical minds of these youngsters and mold their minds where they become greater citizens because we believe that a sound economy cannot be defeated unless we have our people educated. How can a teacher, if he is married or she, with two children, if so to be, can make a go of it at home on $7,000 a year? Well, you know, to me, that is a poverty wage. And do you know that in this great country of ours that there are 24 million people who have been stricken by poverty because of related situations, low wages. These are working people. In a country which is the greatest in the world, harnessed with industry and tools of production, with able-bodied men and women who are willing to work and are stricken by poverty. Well, not only because of low wages, but there are other matters. High cost of living, high interest rates, high price for electricity, utilities, and I often wonder how these people can pay their bills. Well, you know, there are many that who pay these high electric bills and utility bills, they have to skimp at mealtime on the table. They have to take away from the children that you and I know they are entitled to, clothing. There are kids that go to school hungry and ragged. In my great city, the national capital of the great United States, just here a couple of weeks ago, an old lady, around 75, I think she was, she wasn't able to meet her electric bill on a small retirement fund, and she froze to death and died. The electric company the power company has no mercy. You can't pay that bill. The lights are shut off. Well, last week, you know, we talked about some of these things before a congressional committee. Frank Thompson with a congressional committee and he's conducting hearings on the National Labor Relations Act at our request, request of the labor movement, AFL-CIO and Industrial Union Department. Of all the difficulties that we have, that we are confronted with in organizing because of the National Labor Relations Act and the Taft-Hartley law, so we're making a pitch to modify the act. I'm not going to go through all of that. Most of you know what it's all about. But we need some relief in that area. But you know, again I want to say that I want to take you away from Mississippi. 
I want to talk a little bit about North Carolina. Jim Sala here said yesterday, you know, that, that Mississippi is a little above North Carolina. Well, there's a juggling going on between North Carolina and, and the state of Mississippi, which one really is on the bottom ladder, on the economic ladder. And in North Carolina, you know, they, they, they say they're on the bottom ladder. As a matter, I've been trying to keep track of all these statistics, and sometime I find myself in looking at them and trying to evaluate them. I, I, I find myself that I suffer from a statistical indigestion. In North Carolina and Mississippi, sometimes the difference is much as a half a cent of average wages paid. The average wages in the textile industry, which is the backbone of the economy in North Carolina, there it is $3.38 an hour. This compares to the national average of $4.84 for all manufacturing production workers. Now these figures show that Textile workers are a dollar and forty-six cents an hour below the national average. They're shortchanged on a national average basis by fifty-eight dollars and forty cents for forty-hour week. Now that's thirty percent less than all the manufacturing straight-time average earnings. Now this condition has been continuing ever since 1950, when there it was 14% below, and now in, 19, in 1970 it was 27%, and in 1976, the short change of textile workers in North Carolina, they're 30% below the national average. The price that the people pay is enormous because the, the actual ingredients is missing. And everything that the great governor here said to you yesterday, or Monday, he talked about, that is the ingredients that is needed in Mississippi is to organize and get to the bargaining table and upgrade those wages and other improvements that working people are entitled to. Well, I can go on and on here. To some degree, it's just be multiplying it. <clears throat> well, you know, I want to get down to talk a little bit about organizing. I'm not going to bore you too long. Ramsey said last night, you know, he said the way this program has been going, he said, I think we'll be able to finish up before 12. So I assure you, I won't hold you any longer than that, uh, <coughs> President Ramsey. Because I have to get out of here at 12, too, you know. I've got to catch a plane at 1 o'clock. And I've got to go back to work. Well, you know, organizing the vast army of unorganized workers in these great United States here in Mississippi also presents the most important task and a challenge that the AFL, CIO, and the Industrial Union Department is confronted with. Well, we have programs here in the Mid-South and all the way over Southeast. And we have several unions that are in this program. And we have some dozen international unions that are participating in this Mid-Southern States organizing program. And we have some 22 organizers. We're here in Mississippi, we're over in Texas, we're in Alabama, and we're over in Tennessee. So we've been growing a little bit, <coughs> President Ramsey, since you and I first met to talk about, about this kind of activity. But you know, you look at 22 men in a geographical area that I just mentioned, you can say to yourself, that's a skeleton screw crew. Well, you know there are unions in this state, and there are 
use in all these other states. And there is staff in all these states. What we've got to do is do some profound thinking and mobilize our organizing power in working together. And that way, with teamwork and helping each other, I think we can be more successful. Yesterday, you know, you had, a, you had passed action here to increase per capita tax. I think you, the delegates here, done that very seriously because you've been, you have went on record and changed your constitution to increase per capita tax by another nickel. I think that you have answered the heed of your officers in order to carry on the work of this state council, that you need more money. Well, that's, that's true. And you know, with the kind of progress you've been making here, it's been paying off. Now, let me ask you this here, or make a request of you, rather. Let's get started all over again. This per capita increase is not enough to meet the needs of the program that you have chartered by this great state organization. You know what you fellas do and ladies and what we all do in plants that are organized, even in the right to work states, that if you have a member in the plant who is working and he doesn't get in, he's not in the union, you buttonhole him and get in because you want to make that local union 100% strong. And you have reasons for that. Because the stronger you are, the better impression you make on a boss and settle the grievance, and also trying to renew and modify your collective bargaining contract. Now what I'm driving at here is that five cents is not enough, you have local unions in this state who are not affiliated with this great organization. And perhaps some of you from the same international union who are affiliated with this great organization, I think that you all have a responsibility to go out and get your sister local unions to come into this state organization. And we, on the other hand, the IUD with this organizing program, we will try to mobilize and get all the unions interested and concerned in getting into the act of organizing the unorganized. And I talked to a brother here this morning of the International Lady Garment Workers. He tells me that there are 40 plants in their jurisdiction in this state. I said, how many local unions have you got here? He said, we don't have any. Well, what does that mean to you and I? That means we have a job to do. That union has a job to do. It must concern itself about these plants. Because wherever there is a garment plant that's unorganized, or be it a plant for the machinists, or their rubber workers, the oil workers, or steel workers. As long as those people are unorganized, your collective bargaining contracts are threatened by the unorganized workers because they work for cheaper labor. We cannot afford, in this state or anywhere else, to permit industry to operate non-union. Yeah, the governor said you are the greatest economic force in this state. The labor movement is the greatest economic force in this whole great economy of ours in these great United States. We've been struggling ever since 1792 in trying to organize working, working. always meeting with the most vicious opposition by anti-union employers. Now, the only way to overcome that is for us 
to our organized and organizing staff, central labor bodies, state bodies, local unions, wherever in the neighborhood these unorganized workers are, give a helping hand, let's organize them. I'm going over here to Memphis, Tennessee on the ninth meeting with a council over there. And they have expressed an interest and desire to get something moving in a more potential way in a great city of Memphis, Tennessee. I'm looking for perhaps have more activity there. Well, you know, this program of the IUD has some real substance to it. Well, I've been laboring with it with Steve Williams for many years. I've been laboring with it since 1963. If I must brag about it, I've been the architect of it and structured this program under the direction of Walter Ruther when he was president of the IUD. We structured this program because there was not enough activity in the organizing area throughout the breadth of this country. And our sights were set on to pick areas where there are great potential of unorganized industry, unorganized workers. And that in those same areas, there are unions in those areas. And that what is needed is the cooperation and teamwork of these unions talking about international unions, and mobilizing their staff in working together. And we put a coordinator in charge to direct the affairs in the area. Well, the program has, works because it has been better than what the whole labor movement has been doing. If you want to talk about statistics on a whole national average. By comparison, we win more elections than unions on the, as a whole. Now, there are reasons for that. Because this program has something that perhaps is missing by the best of organizers in the field of organizing. And that is that we're closer to the people. We believe in setting up in-plant committees to organize from within. We're closer to the people. There is no substitute for being closer to the people and personal contact work. Yes, and we have trained a lot of young men. And even here under Steve Williams in this great state of Texas over here, and many of them now have some top jobs in international unions. As a Rob being, as Rob being a associated with the Industrial Union Department and this organizer. Yes, we have even cut out competition between unions in trying to organize the same plant. It's difficult enough for a union to try and win an election alone rather than two or three unions trying to organize the same plant at the same time. We have substituted a better understanding of cooperation in place of conflict at the plant. Well, President Ramsey, I don't think there's much more that I want to say. But if we can mobilize our forces within this great convention and the state AFL-CIO to promote legislation, social welfare, and to protect the interests of all the people, through this social legislation and protect economic security, and we all get together of the union who have jurisdiction here and get involved in working together in teamwork, we'll do a hell of a lot better job than we have doing. I have a feeling for the past year now, President Ramsey, we've been here, we haven't been successful. Well, we only came in here under adverse conditions. As Ramby just said, certain things happen in the economy. And the employers in this state have copied perhaps from others, like J.P. Stevens over North Carolina. Most vicious anti-employers, 
anti-union employers in opposing the union. Well, we're doing one thing, we're trying to get the law changed. But you know, you and I got to be just as persistent as Claude Ramsey, who believe that a new day is coming and the progress you're making. I think we're on that road. And from all indications that I get from our men in the field, there are a battery of requests that comes into our offices from unorganized workers and unorganized shops that want to be organized. And I have a feeling because the status of this economy of ours, of where it is, high prices of electricity, interest rate, cost of living, people are reaching out for hope and help, the forgotten people at low wages. Let us all mobilize and get together. Make this one of the best state organizations in the AFL-CIO, and let's do the job we've got to do to organize the unorganized. Thank you very much, Brother Sonnery. We do appreciate your remarks here this morning. We appreciate the fact that you've been able to spend the last three days with us. We do hope that when you go back to Washington that you will advise the top officials of your department, as well as the FFL CIO, that we are making progress in our state. And that much of that progress can be attributed to the fact that the Industrial Union Department, the FFL CIO, and the various international unions have been working long and hard in our state to bring organization to the workforce of Mississippi. We hope that you'll be able to stay around with us a little bit longer. We don't have too much further to go. But if you could, I'd like to ask you to install the new offices, uh, which uh, won't be too far away from now. Now, I wanted to uh, introduce our office staff here this morning. I saw them sitting in the back a few minutes ago. What happened to them? I'd like to ask the chairman of the two committees that haven't yet completed their reports to come up. And I see Kelly bringing a shotgun. I hope he's not planning on shooting somebody here this morning. Now, where is our office staff? Where is Curtis Orman? We have one resolution to put on the table to call up this morning. Is Curtis Orman still here? Huh? Do we have the vice chairman of that committee ready to handle that resolution? One on band to can. Oh, the office staff back here. My office staff is here. I want them to come up to the podium. I want them to come up here. We're going to do something we haven't done. We've got to try to get in good shape here with the office. Ms. Phillips, Ms. Morgan, Ms. Woodard, would you please come forward? I want to let the folks all see who's been doing all the work in this convention. I want you to come up front on the podium. March down now. Come on around 
something. Machinists won't rifle off any more shotguns. Curtis Ullman won this one, and the Boilermaker from the same plant won it last time. <laughs> we, <coughs> there's been a lot said here in this convention about what a good convention it's been, and I think it has perhaps been the best convention since I've been president of the organization. It's been one of the best attended. We've had a very group, good group of delegates. We've had a very good convention. We've had a very good group of delegates. Everything's went off real fine in this convention. Lots been said about the officers of the organization. But you know, we have a number of people that's <clears throat> been working very hard in making this all possible. I thought it'd be appropriate this time to call up our office staff, three girls that work in our office, introduce them to you and give them a round of applause. Now, over here, Pat Woodard, Diane Morgan, and Carolyn Phillips. These are the girls that have done an awful lot of hard work in making all of this possible this convention, and I'd like you to give them a standing round of applause. <laughs> union <laughs> and we will be in negotiations with them go along and I felt that perhaps it might be a little easy on us if we give them some proper recognition here this morning now Kelly you have just announced I believe that you have raffled off the shotgun and Curtis Orman won the shotgun how about that Curtis Orman one of our vice president won the shotgun I want to know who pulled that ticket. Where did you have this drawing? <laughs> a lot of these folks here want to know how you went about pulling that ticket. So Betty Nelson pulled the ticket. All right. Okay. Curtis Ormond's won the shotgun. Another baller maker. What's the baller maker's got? Some of these other folks that got. Keep running these shotguns, huh? All right, at this time, his Brother Davis, yeah, I'd like to call up that resolution that we put on the table yesterday first. We still got the resolutions committee to report, as well as the elections committee, and we'll just about be through with the business before us. Where's Joe Davis? Tell him to come in. We Joe, Joe you are vice chairman of the committee that the Legislative Education Committee. Yeah. Resolution, bottle, resolution number five. The resolution was laid on the table yesterday with an understanding that Brother Mike Mahan, who wanted to amend the resolution, would put those amendments in writing and they would take that resolution up this morning along with the amendments. Are we ready with that resolution? If you're not ready with it, Joe, if you're not ready, we'll go ahead and get the resolutions committee up, let them start their report, and when they get through, we'd like to ask you to be ready to bring it up. Okay? Why don't we do it that way? All right, at this time, the chair is going to recognize Brother Russell Kelly, chairman of the Resolutions Committee, to begin its report to the convention. Brother Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Betty Nelson, she's our secretary on the committee, to come forward and submit the committee's report. Betty. Resolution number six, foreign imports and union labels. Since these resolutions are in front of you, I'm not going to take my time in reading these. I'm going real fast since we're in a hurry. 
whereas the continuing growing share of the United States domestic market is being captured by companies importing many products from low-wage countries, and if the present trend of importing continues, many more American workers will be out of jobs. Many of these products were originally made by union workers in this country, and many other union members are losing their jobs because the American consumer is buying foreign imports as well as non-union goods and services and whereas workers in several different groups have already been affected, such as people employed in manufacturing of shoes, clothing, steel, electronic equipment, cars, and others, and whereas even though some process has been, progress has been made on the import question in the last few years, labor must still put forth a maximum effort to stop the flood of imports into this country. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the 8th Biennial Convention of the Mississippi AFL-CIO does go on record in favor of the following items. Number one, call upon the Congress of the United States to impose quotas on all products from foreign countries where heavy unemployment is occurring in that particular industry in the United States. Ask the Congress of the United States to lower quotas that are already set too high and where unemployment is still occurring in that industry in the United States. Page two. Also ask the Congress not to provide any more money to foreign countries to develop skills and industries that will produce products from imports to the United States where these products will cause further unemployment to that industry in the United States. Number two, appeal to all American manufacturers to cease sending their work or products to be made in foreign countries. Number three, appeal to the general labor movement of the United States to buy only American-made products as well as union-made products and services. Number four, also to try to educate the American consumer on the grave problem facing the American workers and encourage all consumers to buy and use American-made products as well as union-made products and services. Be it, be it finally resolved that co copies of this resolution be sent to the necessary individuals and organizations to call attention to the serious problem, respectively submitted Mississippi AFL's executive board. The board, uh, the resolutions committee moved that we adopt this resolution. You've heard the committee's report and the motion to concur in resolution number six. Do we have a discussion on that motion? Okay. Did you get the full mic over there, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is Lamar Strong from the AFT Local 3453. I'd like to go on record as being opposed to this. main part I'm opposed to is the part of quotas. I don't think we've had enough discussion yet to pass this resolution because what we got here is a very explosive issue. And when it goes before the United States Congress, I don't think it's going to have a chance to pass. I don't think you can place quotas because you're getting a problem on about free trade with other countries. We got industries in the United States that import goods to our foreign countries. And I don't think they're going to stand by idly and let us place quotas on their products and not place quotas on our products also in return. Now I say I want to know from somebody else what this is going to do to other industries to export goods from the United States to foreign countries. It's going to cause the repercussions in these countries or not. Thank you. We have any further discussion now. If I understood the gentleman correctly, Part of the resolution that you're opposed to is you're opposed to quotas being imposed upon foreign-made goods brought into the country. Is that correct? Do we have any other discussion on the resolution? Chair recognizes Brother Beckham. T.G. Beckham, business agent of IBEW Local 1435, Jackson, Mississippi. Mr. Chairman, I concur in this resolution. The company that, that the people that I represent has 78 plants scattered around over the world. 
They bring that there's not a, that they don't sell a radio. I'm talking about General Electric. They don't manufacture a radio that is sold in this country. They don't manufacture a television set that is manufactured in this country. They manufacture the parts in Taiwan and other places over in the Far East. They bring them to Mexico. They got a big tin barn down there across the border. They assemble them and then they bring them across the border in trucks to their distribution centers and put them on the American market for the American price. And it is killing our people. The light bulbs, the Christmas tree bulbs that is manufactured in Japan is brought into this country, sold for three prices from what they should be sold for, and our people then being laid off. It's in all of the industry as far as General Electric is concerned, and I'm sure that there are other international unions that has lost membership for that same purpose. Therefore, I am in, uh, in concur in the resolution. Question. Thank you, Brother Bacon. Any further discussion? Yeah, I recognize Brother Arnold. Mr. Chairman, I'm Charles Arnold, Local 792 in Jackson with the IUE. I was on the committee and I wholeheartedly say that we ought to support this resolution on the basis that for the electrical industry, for an example, the IUE in the category of uh, the, the, the jobs in which we represent, we feel there has been 100,000 jobs in the last five to seven years lost to foreign made products because the electrical industry has been captured by some of the low paying industries that, uh, outside the United States, for an example, RCA, General Electric, Westinghouse, and many other ones. We have lost jobs too. And this does not say in any way that we're not, uh, there's already quotas in the United States, so therefore we're talking about limiting the quotas where it'll have a balance of trade, whereby that our people in the clothing industry and the shoe industry and in the electrical industry and in many other uh, cases, in the auto industry, for an example, that people are losing jobs by the thousand. And what we're talking about is, is buying American-made products and uh, protecting jobs for uh, people in the United States. Certainly that if we, if we don't have a job, we can't buy these products. And I wholeheartedly recommend this resolution. Thank you, Brother Arnold. Question. Any further discussion? I'd like to point out to the gentleman that raised the objection he had examined the language in the resolution on the item that he's talking about, item one. It says, in that particular industry in the United States, where unemployment is occurring in that particular industry in the United States, we're talking about the industries that are being hard hit by the foreign import problem. And if you examine that rather closely, we're not talking about any and all industries. That resolution and that particular part of it is pointed at those industries that have been hard hit. And we've got plants in Mississippi that are shut down. I was talking with the director of ANI board just a few months ago. And he advised me that at that time that there were 10 vacant plants. Various areas of our state, mostly apparel industries, that had had to shut down, shut down complete operation because of the threat from foreign-made goods. They undercut the, the, the products produced in this country and the plants down, down of Oklahoma. Large plant represented by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, just to cite one plant. Shut down just last year. Those people are, are now out of work, primarily because Imported goods in, into this country undercut the prices of goods produced in that plant to such a point that they had to close the whole plant down and over 600 workers are now unemployed. That's just one example. So it's hit in our state, not just that, some other places. Any other discussion? Ready for the question? All in the...
in favor of adopting the motion on resolution number six, signify it by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Sister Nelson. Resolution number seven, organizing the unorganized. Whereas organized labor has made considerable progress in Mississippi during recent years, our political success during last year's elections is indicative of this fact and whereas political success and organizing success go hand in hand, as a matter of fact, newly organized local unions were largely responsible for the election of a number of friendly legislators in last year's election and Whereas thousands of Mississippi workers are not organized and do not enjoy the benefits of a union contract, the wages and working conditions of these workers are substandard and they pose a constant threat to each and every union member. It is therefore of great importance that they be organized and, whereas our state is growing industrially and the num number of or organized workers is constantly on the increase, many of these workers have indicated a, des a desire to become union members and hardly a day passes that some worker does not call the state AFL-CIO office for assistance. Without a doubt, the major unfinished business of the AFL-CIO is that of organizing and the unorganized workers in our state. And whereas the executive board of the Mississippi AFL-CIO is grateful to the industrial union department for presently conducting a coordinated organizing program in North Mississippi. And we are grateful that a number of international unions are currently attempting to organize in their respective jurisdictions. The fact remains that these efforts need to be intensified. We are convinced that the time is right for a concerted organizing effort in our state. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the delegates in attendance at this eighth biennial convention do sincerely call upon the all AFL-CIO unions to intensify the efforts to organize the unorganized workers in Mississippi and be it further resolved that we call upon all local unions and central labor unions, central labor councils throughout the state to assist in this effort. In doing so, they will not only help their fellow man, but will protect the interests of their members as well. Respectfully submitted, Mississippi AFL Executive Board. The Resolutions Committee uh, moves to adopt this resolution. You've heard the committee's report and the motion to adopt resolution number seven. Do we have any discussion on that resolution? Thank you, self. I think the resolution is self explanatory. Any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number seven signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, if I'd be, a, if I'd be in order. We could dispense of, of reading the whereas. If they, they've had this material for three days, most of it. We could just read the resolve and speed it up just a little bit. Okay. If that would be in order. Well, then we'll I'd like to make that motion. We'll leave that up to the discretion of the, of the committee. They, <laughs> we don't want to start infringing on their prerogatives. They, if they want to read the resolve, then uh, that's all right with me. But uh, this is on organizing, so I'm going to present Brother Nick Zonrick at this time that resolution since he's sitting on the podium. Brother Zonrick. Thank you for the privilege. <clears throat> Organize, this is resolution number seven. Organizing the unorganized. Whereas. Just just to give it to you. Oh, you wanted to give it to me? Yeah, I oh. didn't want to give it to you. Oh, I thought you just read it. Yeah, I just want you to have a copy. He misunderstood me. I just wanted him to have a copy of the resolution. No, I just wanted you to have a copy to carry it back with you. Yeah. All right, uh, Chair Rank, we did adopt that one, didn't we? Huh? No, we didn't put the question. All in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number seven, signify it by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Sister Nelson. Resolution number eight, affiliation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this eighth biennial convention of the Mississippi AFL-CIO does go on record expressing appreciation to the AFL-CIO Executive Council and all international unions for their past efforts and cooperation in this important matter. We strongly urge all international unions to enforce affiliation requirements in their constitutions to the extent that full affiliation is achieved and 
be it further resolved that President Meany be urged to immediately reactivate and expand the Executive Council Committee on affiliation and that this convention goes on record given top priority to the task of affiliating all AFL-CIO local unions with the state AFL-CIO and the local central body bodies and be it finally resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to all parties concerned. Uh, the resolutions committee uh, moves this to be adopted. You break the committee's report and a motion to adopt resolution number seven, which again is self-explanatory. Do we have any discussion? Eight. eight? Sorry, eight. Right. You ready for the question? All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Just enough. Resolution number 10, 1976, presidential election. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the delegates assembled in this convention in Jackson, Mississippi, on March 22nd, 24th, 1976, do call upon the National Democratic Party to nominate a candidate for president who has compassion for people and a candidate that can get this country moving again. And be it further resolved that the de delegates do repudiate the sorrow record of Gerald Ford as president of these United States and that they pledge to do everything possible to help defeat him at the polls on November the 2nd, 1976. And be it finally resolved that copies of this uh, resolution be mailed to Governor Cliff Finch, the chairman of the National Democratic Party and the chairman of the Mississippi Democratic Party. The Resolutions Committee moved this adoption. You've heard the committee's recommendations and the motion to adopt resolution number 10. <coughs> 10, excuse me. Do we have any discussion on that motion? Ready for the question? Question. All in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. I think it should be said in passing that this is probably one of the most important resolutions in my opinion, to be considered by the convention. And you can be assured of one thing, after the National Democratic Committee meets, and after the FFL-CO endorses a candidate, which I feel reasonably sure they will, we're going to be calling on all of you to help do something about this particular problem here in this state and nation of ours. Sister Nelson, ready? I'm glad I didn't read all of number 10 because it had an ugly word in it. Okay, resolution number 11. Uh, the uh, chairman of this committee has asked that I read this entirety because it was something that was drawn up yesterday. Subject, Mississippi products. Whereas a continued growing share of the Mississippi pro market is being captured by companies importing many products from other states, and if the present trend of importing continues, many more Mississippi workers will be out of jobs. Many of these products were originally made by union members in the state, and many other union members are losing their jobs because the Mississippi agencies are buying out-of-state imports as well as non-union goods and services, and whereas workers in several different groups have already been affected, such as people employed in manufacturing of shoes, clothes, and fillets, electronic equipment, tires, and other items. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the 8th Biennial Convention of the Mississippi AFL-CO does go on record in favor of the following items. Number one. Call upon the governor and all of the state agency heads of the state of Mississippi to purchase Mississippi-made products and, whenever possible, purchase union-made products and services. Be it finally resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to the necessary individuals and organizations to call attention to the serious problem. The Resolutions Committee moves this adoption. This is a resolution drafted by the Resolutions Committee, right? Committed to the convention. Did you make copies of it available to all the delegates? They do have the resolution. The resolution, I think, is explanatory. The chair recognizes, let me state the motion first. The committee has made its report. The motion is to adopt resolution number 11, which was drafted by the Resolutions <coughs> Committee and submitted to the convention. <coughs> We have a discussion on a motion to adopt resolution number 11. Do I recognize the Brother Fly? Bob Fly, local 303 rebel workers. This come out of my local union, and we have rebel workers laid off. I see some people out of the 
uh, woodworkers and everywhere else over this state that makes plywood, tires, and everything else. We've heard a lot of discussion here about national, international, and everything else, what we're going to do. But right now, we can't even convince our people. We donate. We spend a lot of our tax money advertising Mississippi. Uh, what are we going to do? The a and I board have spent money talking about spending money in Mississippi. I think it's time that we call on our agencies to buy the products that's made by union labor right here in the state. I have about 50 people laid off in my union. If they would just buy enough tires for the state automobiles here, they would be an industry created with 50 people because all of my people would be back to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brother Spy. Any more discussion? Shall I recognize Brother Joe Davis? Joe Davis, Mississippi Executive Board. I've got, I'd like to ask the Chairman of the Committee a couple of questions. I don't understand the resolution. Or can okay. I, would you explain it? Chairman. Brother Kelly, Chairman of the Committee. You're, okay, sta <laughs> you're stating in here that you're asking uh, the state agency to purchase Mississippi-made products, comma, and whenever possible, union-made products. Is this resolution saying that we should buy Mississippi products even if they're not union before we go across the state line and buy a union-made product? Yes, that's what the resolution says. Uh, well, I'd be very much opposed to that because most of the products made in Mississippi are non-union, and we very well better depend on some of these other states, these good brothers and sisters, to help us out. And if we say... We're going to go with the rats in Mississippi and forget everybody in the other 50, uh, 49 states. We're in bad trouble. <laughs> a rat in Mississippi is no better than a rat in uh, Louisiana. <laughs> and I'd like to ask the delegates to vote this resolution down. Thank you. You have any further discussion on resolution number 11? I'd like to amend that resolution, Mr. Chairman, to strike the words that's concerning this young man about union-made Mississippi, that we still buy Mississippi-made product, but just strike out that non-union part of that resolution then. Amend that resolution. Why, did you get a copy of it there, Bob? No, I, I do not have a copy. The chairman could uh, read it. It was uh, other uh, secretaries that would read by striking that out. While he's, while he's, Brother Kelly's working on that, let me, let's take care of another little item here. We asked you, advised you yesterday that you had a presidential preference ballot in your kits. If you haven't <laughs> marked that ballot as to what your preference is, we'd like to ask you to do so uh, and drop it in that box. We'd like to see who your favorite presidential candidate is. Slimply a straw pole of the convention. <coughs> straw pole of the convention. You got it, Brother Kelly? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Brother Kelly thinks he's got it. Let's see if this is what you wanted, how you wanted to amend it, Bob. Okay, has everyone got a copy of the resolution? No. Okay. This is the way I understood your, re uh, your amendment, Bob. It's called upon the governor and all other state agencies, heads and of the state of Mississippi to purchase Mississippi union-made products and services. Also, before that word service, union service, because we're letting a lot of contracts in here with this building and trade bunch is not union-made, too. Union Put that in there. And well, union services. And union services. Okay. Because you got a lot of union-service union carpenters, 
iron workers and everything else, we want them included in that too. That's what the word service meant. Union, union yeah. services. Right. You got it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. I always put it over here. Right. Union made products. Made products. And union union service. Okay. All right, let me. Now, the amendment proposed by Brother Fly would change the resolution. Call upon the government of all state agency heads of the state of Mississippi to purchase union-made products and union services. <coughs> That's the way it would read. Now, we we got the amendment and union services, right. Union-made products and union services in Mississippi. Now, that's an amendment uh, offered by Brother Fly. Do we have a second to that uh, amendment? Second. All right, let's take care of the amendment first, Brother Beckham. I'll recognize you next. I want, to I want to talk on the amendment. Okay, you'll get it on the amendment. All right, the amendment now is before the House. It's proposed by Brother Fly. Chair is going to recognize Brother Beckham to talk on the amendment. Brother Beckham. Thank you. I rise to talk on this amendment. I concur in this uh, amendment because the state of Mississippi, I'm not saying that the light bulbs that was put in the new state office building when it was built several years ago, but there was three car loads of fluorescent lamps shipped into this state when we make them right down here on Highway 80 and they are union made. They bought Jewel and Westinghouse. I'm not running Westinghouse down because we have some Westinghouse local unions in the, our international union. But the state of Mississippi went outside of the state and bought three car loads of fluorescent lamps and put in the present office building. There was four car loads put into this uh, Walter Sellers building and the Supreme Court building. And we make those bubs dry here in Mississippi with Mississippi people. But they go out of the state and buy them from somebody else. So I think that when you're talking about keeping money in Mississippi, that they should buy their products if they are union made in Mississippi. I right. wonder how many people are in this room today that owns a foreign-made automobile. When those automobiles are bought, they are shipped in. What does that do? That takes union jobs away from the people of this country. Just think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Beckham. Any further discussion on the amendment? Brother Tucker? This is Delegate Raymond Tucker from Local Union 917. Mr. Chairman, if I understand the amendment correctly, then I'm in favor of the amendment and the motion. And if I understand it, we'll buy union-made products first and whenever possible that they are made in the state of Mississippi. Right, that's what it says. And services. Right. Thanks. All right, are you ready to vote on the amendment? All in favor of the amendment signified by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Now, the question occurs on the motion to adopt the resolution as amended. Are you ready for that question? All in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number 11 as amended, signified by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Sister Nelson, you got another one? This is it, she said. This is it, and the reason for this is that Mississippi's AFL-CIO is the only one so far that uh, has not done this, so this is the reason. Resolution number 12, subject, the Mississippi American Federation of Teachers as the teacher organization. Whereas the Mississippi American Federation of Teachers is the only teachers organization in the state of Mississippi affiliated with the national AFL-CIO, the state AFL-CIO, and the individual local central labor councils. Whereas the Missi Mississippi American Federation of Teachers is the only teachers organization in the state of Mississippi made up of teachers and not management, such as superintendents, principals, and supervisors. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Mississippi American Federation of Teachers will be recognized by the Mississippi AFL-CIO as the teachers organization in the state of Mississippi. The Resolutions Committee moved this adoption. All 
All right, you've heard the committee's report, and that is another resolution coming out of the Resolutions Committee, which is number 12, which I think the resolution is self-explanatory. The motion to adopt resolution number 12 is before the House. Do we have any discussion on that motion? If not, all in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number 12 signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Brother Kelly has asked me, that he has requested that we dismiss his committee with the thanks of the convention. The committee stands dismissed. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> now, what about the can resolution? Brother Davis, you ready? Brother Joe Davis, the vice chairman of the Education and Cope Committee, Legislative Committee. I understand Brother McMahon, who proposed the amendment, would like to have the floor for a minute. Brother McMahon? Yes, Eddie McMahon, President of Local 230 Glass Bottle Blower Association. Mr. Chairman, after talking with aluminum workers about the amendment, we as the Glass Bottle Blower Association withdraw the amendment. All right, so the motion, if it's okay with the convention, that Brother Mike Mann will like to withdraw the amendment that he proposed here yesterday. We've had a little discussion on this morning. Any objections to him withdrawing uh, the amendments that he proposed? If, if it's okay, then uh, th those amendments have been withdrawn, and the motion now before the House is to adopt resolution. What's the number of it? Five. Number five. That's before the House again. Now, do we have any discussion on that motion to adopt resolution number five? All in favor of that motion signified by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Thank you very much, Brother Davis. You, I guess, would like to dismiss your committee with the thanks of the convention. Let's give them a round of applause. Where is Sister Marinelle Whips at this point? We want to get that out of the way, and then we're going to call up the Elections Committee to give their report. recognizes Bob Whitson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In behalf of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, I would like to extend our appreciation to you for the wonderful support you gave us during this convention. As we've said, we are holding our national conference in New Orleans in May. We'll certainly be sending some of your local, uh, your local unions letters about it, and hopefully you will give consideration to uh, sending delegates, uh, delegate to that conference. Again, we appreciate it. We're going to continue to do what we can to bring about broader participation within labor's programs throughout the state of Mississippi, which is badly needed. At this time, we're going to give away the table and also the certificate for the tie that was donated by Armstrong Rubber Company. Now, it's, it's going to be pretty bad for somebody who lives in Columbus to have to drive the Natchez to get a tie. So maybe if somebody in Columbus or some other part of the state win that certificate, they may want to catch Bob Fly before he leave and get him to pick it up from Armstrong and keep it for him. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Butler. 
raise his table and just call him and tell him to come pick it up. You have his phone now. Dead went. Okay. Here's a man here will carry okay. it to him, right there. You pick it up here after we get through with the convention business. Now we're going to have the drawing for the tire. Claude, will you draw that one for us, please? You want me to get one? Yeah. Congratulations to all the winners, and again, I would like to say thanks because I was the one begging more so than anybody else. And thanks again to the convention, and thank you, Claude. Thank you very much, Mayor Al, Bob. All right, is Brother Wood ready? Brother Wood, Chairman of the Elections Committee, if he would come forward now and give us a report of his committee. And I think while he's getting up here, I should... He wants the whole committee. He wants his whole committee up here with him, he said. The whole committee, the elections committee, please come forward. We're their chairman. I don't think there's any question about it. This committee perhaps had the toughest job of any committee in the whole convention. And I was a little bit surprised when I walked in there this morning to see how they was getting along. They advised me they were just about through and they would be ready to report to this convention on time. So to get up here, we'll recognize Brother Wood, the chairman of that committee. got a couple of members of this committee is not here right now, but we're going to go ahead anyhow. If they come in, tell them come on up. Brother Wood might want to recognize them here in a minute. This time, a chair recognizes Brother W.H. Wood to give the report of the elections committee. Brother Wood. Chairman Ramsey, officers, delegates of this convention, with the chairman's permission, I would like to go astray and make a few remarks before I put the dead wood on somebody here. You have the floor. You have the floor. Your chairman, your esteemed chairman, is a man recognized by all of us as being the boss of we organized people in Mississippi. I would like to draw your attention that uh, you don't think about what it means to be to reciprocate one way or the other. For longer than he has been chairman of the AFL-CIO, I've been chairman of the Mississippi State Council of Carpenters. Each and every convention we have, hold, which is annually, this cat's invited. We roll out the red carpet. He has the time that he desires to lift the rafters, tell us what is and what's not. He's invited to our convention, and he's invited to eat with us, partake of our grub, of which he does very generously. We have never tried to yoke him with unpleasant tasks. I have you know he does not reciprocate with me. <laughs> this is the third time that he has put this yoke on my neck. <laughs> but I'll have to hand it to him because apparently he knows his helpers. He has always come forth with some very efficient help. This time is no exception because the following named people that you see here at this, on this podium, were efficient. They know what they're doing. 
Brother Hutto, Chin, Stewart, Peterson, Carter, and Oglesby. And without the help of these people that you met up here as known as his staff, our job would have been greater than what it was because he does have somebody that knows how to work. The first time we attempted this job, it took us about half the night until the time the convention was trying to adjourn, which was at the noon the following day. Over a period of time, we evolved a method which has cut our time considerably. And would Ms. Stewart please come to the podium, please, and be recognized? So the task that has one, at, at one time was, we thought, almost insurmountable, as I say over the years, has, has grown less so by adequate help and a little brain work. Changing the subject radically, I'm a building tradesman. The resolutions that have been passed here today, the word services, means just exactly what it says, services, which includes we building tradesmen. In Jackson, Mississippi, I can truthfully say that the, the union people in Jackson, Mississippi, do not use the union services of the carpenters, or I would know. When I go to the stores and ask for the union label in the, in the, in the clothes I put on, the people look at me like I'm a fool. They say, what are you talking about? So somebody's not doing a job. And I beg you, we've talked about get together, do this and help each other. When you have work to do at your house or when you build a new home or when your plant is in the process of expanding, for God's sake, think about your brother members. We build and trade them. Mr. Chairman, you have the following report Mr. Russell Kelly received 27,088 votes Robert Woodson received 26,371 votes R.L. Tucker received 24,594 votes James Jackson received 27,686 votes. Wade Chatham received 10,729 votes. Curtis Orman received 26,822 votes. Wade Chatham was eliminated. Executive Board, Laverne Tucker, received 23,858. Robert Williams received 10,257. Amy Hollowell, 26,274. Marvin Taylor, 19,462. Joe Davis, 23,374. Cecil Shelton, 27,057. R.N. Grantham, 25,714. Lewis Turner, 23,740. Howard Underwood, 26,870. Mary Bryant, 23,599. Gerald Dempsey, 20,636. Ray Maglinus, 4,801. A ride in, Betty Nelson, 10,877. The following were eliminated. Herbert Williams. Ray Magdanus. Betty Nelson. Those are the elected officers. The building that we have enjoyed for the last three days was as near union built 
as anything that's ever been built in Jackson, Mississippi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Wood, and thank this committee for such an excellent job. And Brother Wood, regard to your remarks, about the fact that it seems that the president of this organization is picking on the president of the state council of carpenters. I want to assure you that we recognize efficiency when we see it. And we're not going to start riding a new horse as long as we got a good old one that can do the job. You know, that's the reason you still chairman of that committee. We appreciate that hard work. All right, at this time, we're going to ask the newly elected executive board members to please come to the podium, all of you. Yes, with the thanks of the convention. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> all of the newly elected executive board members, all of you come forward to get the, uh, to receive the obligation. Now, don't everybody pack up and leave the hotel. We're not quite through. Where's Bob Woodson? Somebody see if they can find Bob Woodson. I imagine he's right out there in the hall. Come on in here, Bob. <laughs> Everybody's present except Brother Orman. I understand he got called out of town on a problem. Everybody be here to receive the obligation except Brother Orman, and we'll take care of that when he attends the next board meeting. He is uh, an incumbent in office already, so it won't hurt anything if uh, we have to wait a little while to give him the obligation. This time I'm going to recognize Brother Zonrick again for the purpose of giving the obligation to the newly elected officers, Brother Zonrick. <clears throat> it is my honor and privilege to perform this duty to install the elected officers for the ensuing term. <clears throat> Will you all and repeat your name after mine? I, Zonridge, do hereby promise to faithfully perform the duty of the office to which I have been elected to the best of my ability and to the benefit and honor of the Mississippi AFL-CIO. And in the event of resignation or removal from office, or at the expiration of my term, I promise to deliver to my successor All property in my possession belonging to this council. I further promise to protect and defend the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations during my, office, during my term of office. May I wish the elected officers best wishes for a successful term. I'll have you have a seat. We'll uh, have a seat. I in keeping with past practice. After election of officers, we have always afforded each member of the newly elected executive board an opportunity to have a few words to say to the delegates at the convention. First, let me say that I deeply appreciate <coughs> the fact that you've seen fit to reelect me again as your president. I'm forever, I will be forever grateful, and I assure you 
that we'll continue to do everything we can to further the interests of the trade union movement in my state as well as the interests of all of the citizens of our state. This time I'll recognize Brother Woodson at this end, see if he'd like to have a few words to say. Brother Bob Woodson. Thank you, Chairman Ramsey, Secretary Treasurer Knight, and fellow officers, delegates, and brother, sister, labor. It's, uh, I'd like to express my appreciation to you for the vote of confidence you gave me in re-electing me as Vice President of the Mississippi AFL-CIO. I can assure you that I will continue to the best of my ability to carry out the responsibilities of this office and do everything in my power to continue to promote labor in its wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> you know, say, Brother Knight, the last year, I want to get all the vice presidents, uh, Brother Jackson over here. Brother James Jackson. Thank you, Claude. Yeah. I'm not going to have much to say. I know it's been a long convention. Everybody's pretty well worn out. You have my solemn pledge that I will continue to do everything I can to further the cause of the entire labor movement in this state as I've done in the past, and I certainly appreciate you re-electing me to this office. Thank you. Brother Tucker, Vice President Tucker. Thank you, Brother Ramsey, and to the delegates. I I'm sure that we all would like to say that we appreciate the confidence and the, the vote of confidence that you give us and we are there again I'll just go right along with what brother James Jackson said we'll be doing our best to represent the entire labor movement thank you again <laughs> brother Russell Kelly vice president Kelly yes I certainly appreciate the support from the delegates and I'm totally committed to the labor movement and I'm gonna stay that way we get Brother Laverne Tucker now, board member, Brother Tucker. I'd like to thank all the delegates for the support you've given me, and I'll do the best job that I can. <laughs> Brother Joe Davis. I'm not going to say much. I really appreciate the, uh, the vote. And you know, the, the elections are over. We're all in the Mississippi AF of LCIO. And everybody should try to work together and make this organization the best damn thing in the state. Thank you. How about that? Brother Lewis Turner. Mr. Chairman and fellow officer, I would like to say to all of you who supported me in this election, I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart, and I'll do everything I can to do the best job that I can. I've been in the ma labor movement, will be 30 years in July. Maybe I shouldn't have told you, I might tell you how old I am. But I've been in the labor movement, be 30 years this coming July, and I intend to stay in it as long as I live. Thank you. Sister Bryant, Mary Bryant. Thank you, Claude. I'd like to thank all of you for re-electing me, and I'll certainly continue to do everything I can to further the labor movement. If any of you have any wishes you'd like for me to carry out, I'd be glad to hear from you. Thank you. Now we've got a brand new member of our board, I see here, Brother Dempsey. That's correct, isn't it, Dempsey? Congratulations, Brother Dempsey. I would like to thank you, uh, Delegate Chief, for bestowing the honor of uh, electing me to the executive board, and I would like to commit myself to fulfill the obligations of the uh, Mississippi AFL-CIO. Brother Marvin Taylor, one of old war horses here, Brother Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey. First of all, I'd like to express appreciation for the nice vote you gave me re-electing me to the board. I've been serving in this position on the board one way or another for quite a few years. Uh, I hadn't had the best of health in the last three or four years. I hope that I can be more active in the future than I have in the immediate few years. I'd like to point out a situation, however, 
You've heard all along during this convention about where we are, where we've come from, and where we're going, and that sort of thing. To reiterate that old pop song, We've Come a Long Ways, Baby, I'd like to point out a little bit of difference in the atmosphere over at the legislative hall uh, that we recently visited. Now, just a few short years ago, I was on the interviewing committee. We interviewed a, a candidate for governor. If there had been a back door, uh, we'd have been carried in the back door on that same level that we was meeting the other day. We uh, went in kind of through a, a sneak through. We talked to the candidate. He uh, said, well, I would like to have you vote, but uh, please don't make it public. Now, the atmosphere that we uh, uh, experienced over there the other day uh, has made a 180 degree turn. I saw two or three uh, representatives in, uh, from the gallery down on the floor. I caught their eye, I waved, without, almost without exception. They made their way all the way up to where we were in the gallery and wanted to shake hands, and they did shake hands. We had the same reception over in the Senate. We had these people come out here and break bread with us last night, so I think we have indeed come a long way, baby. Thank you very much. Sister Amy Hollowell, another new member of our board, but no stranger to a lot of us. Amy? Well, I don't really know what to say, so I don't guess I'll say very much. But I do appreciate your confidence in giving me your vote and support. And, uh, of course, this is all new to me. And, uh, like Claude said, I've been around a long time. But, uh, anyway... Uh, if any time I can be of any help, and I'll certainly do my best to carry on the uh, office, you know, with Claude and Tom, and I know I can get help whenever I need it. And I appreciate you, uh, all of you voting for me, and thank you. Brother Cecil Shelton. Thank you, Mr. Shelton, for a night and delegates, I'd like to express my appreciation and thanks to all of you for re-electing me to the board. As you have seen in your kit, a little chart that say, the job is not finished until the paperwork is done. <laughs> and our paperwork is not done, but we are just re-elected to the board. And it's with your help this year, as you did in 1975, which we strive in 75, but in this year, 1976, and we worked together as we did in the past, 75, we can get a fix in 76 come November. Thank you. From Howard Underwood. I would just like to say from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for your vote of confidence and if I can ever be of any service to any union member throughout the state of Mississippi, feel free to call Howard Underwood, Mantachi, Mississippi. And that's in Etiwamba County, the county that furnished the tuxedo for Governor Cliff Finch to be inaugurated in. I thank you. Brother E.M. Grantham. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for the confidence that you showed in me and, me and re elected me to the board. If I can ever be of any help to any of you, please feel free to call me and I'll be there. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce your secretary treasurer, Brother Thomas Knight. Mr. President, if I had time, I'd tell a dirty joke on Howard Underwood. <laughs> now, you don't know the joke about that, but we don't have time. I want to very sincerely and very humbly express my appreciation to you for having again expressed your overwhelming confidence in me. 
I want to thank Sister Ruth White for doing such a good job delivering that nominating speech that I wrote for her. She did a real good job. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I hope that the delegates here will take a good look at our board here. And I want to remind you again of what I said Monday morning about the folks out there that are not yet a part of the mainstream of the labor movement. You just adopted a resolution, I believe it's resolution number eight. Now I want to urge you to read that resolution again. And I want you to go back, I hope you will at least. And you know those people in your area that are not part of the mainstream of the labor movement. We've had the largest delegation here, really, to our surprise in this convention that we've ever had. We've had many, many compliments from many of you about the convention. We certainly appreciate the fact that you are here, that you've gotten something out of this convention. So I just hope that you'll go back and you'll remind the people that are not in the labor movement all the way, that they missed something, that they should have been here. They should have had all of the privileges of the floor, the voice, the vote, that everything goes with it. I realize there have been those of you that would like to back off in the corner and talk about various problems or things on your mind. Some few we've had an opportunity to talk to. Others we've just spoke to some maybe not we didn't maybe we didn't get a chance to speak to it's not because we didn't want to this thing gets pretty hectic sometimes from where we sit or stand i just want to say to you if you're here if there's something you want to talk about if you can stick around a little while even though we got a board meeting we'll do our best to talk to you about whatever you have on your mind but again let me express my appreciation now, i know president ramsey has excuse the registration committee but i too want to thank those people the chairman brother jackson for assisting me trying to help me do my job because it's certainly hectic sometime when we have a large delegation and that we are here for is to service you to serve you and i want to personally thank that committee for helping me do my job we we'll look forward to working with you another two years we invite your criticism, we, uh, but please, for God's sake, if you've got criticism, tell us about it. If you've got something on your mind, call us, write us a letter, or come by and talk to us about it. We'll discuss it and see what can be done about it. Go back to your various areas and remember the legislation that has been legislated here in this convention. And if we'll do this, if we'll take our places and meet our responsibility, I remind you again that the officers, this executive board, will not be able to deliver the goods unless we have the total support of the labor movement across this state. And I just believe that this group here, with those out there that I feel that we can recruit will rally to the call and rise to the occasion, and we'll be able to do that job that's got to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Knight. Lots been said at this convention about <coughs> Claude Rams and Tom Knight progress we've made in our state. But you know, <clears throat> many of the accomplishments we've had in our state, and the reason that Claude Ramsey and Tom Knight have been able to do a commendable job in the eyes of many people, centers around the fact that down through the years, you've seen fit to elect a good capable executive board to work with the two of us. We've been blessed as long as I've been president 
to have an outstanding group of people serving in that capacity. They should be given a lot of the credit that Tom Knight and Claude Ramsey has been given at this convention, and I want all of you to know that. I think you have again elected a very good executive board, and I'm looking forward to working with all of them the next couple of years. I also want to commend the delegates that have attended this convention. This has been, in my opinion, the best convention we've had since I've been president of this organization. It's been the best attended. We've had more delegates, registered delegates at this convention than any convention in the history of the organization, 306 delegates. That's a record number. You've been a very good audience. You've attended all of the conventions. It does us all good to look out there when we start one of these things to see an attentive audience and people that are interested in the affairs of the organization. And you've been here. You've been here for every session, and I appreciate it, and I want you to know that. Now, we have a lot of hard work yet to do, but I know that we've got the folks out there to get on with the job, you know. We've had a lot of success in 75, but we got to move that port out of that White House in 76 and get it fixed in 76, like Cecil Sheldon said. But I'm convinced with the leadership that we got now in the governor's office, and with the dedication of you people, that we're going to turn things around and we're going to elect a good president of the United States. That's the next major, major job faced by this organization. All right, now, we're about, about to, we're going to have, give you an opportunity now to have a few words yourself, anybody's got anything on their mind. But I would like to announce the result of the poll that was taken, because I realize that a lot of people perhaps misplaced their ballot. We should have put this out and, and took it up on the first day while we had a full delegation present, but I think it is indicative, perhaps, of the feelings of most of the delegates here. I'd like to call it out for you. Jimmy Carter received 71 votes. Frank Church, two votes. Fred Harris, one vote. Hubert Humphrey, 58 votes. Henry Jackson, 24 votes. Ronald Reagan, two votes. Sergeant Shriver, one vote. George Wallace, 21 votes. Well, you know, I think that speaks pretty good for this group here. <laughs> Mr. Taylor said he didn't get to cast his vote, so we'd give Carter one more. I thought you'd be interested in those results, okay? All right, now we're under welfare of the Mississippi F of L C O. The floor is now open for... Any remarks any of the delegates would like to make? Yes, sir. I don't believe I did, and I think perhaps it would be appropriate this time. Uh, we've thanked everybody except them, I believe. Brother Knight asked me if I'd thank the sergeant at arms, and I don't believe we have. But Brother Clark, stand up and take a bow. And all of the sergeant at arms that have served this convention. <laughs> Appreciate all the hard work that you've done here in this convention. All right, the floor now is open for purpose of delegates wanting to have a few words to say. Brother Beckham. Thank you, Brother Ramsey. I know that I have been to this mic quite a few times, but I will assure you that every time that I got up here, that I made my remarks because of the people that I represent were interested in them. And I want to echo the same sentiments that you made that this was a good convention. It was. It was a wonderful convention. And it was a large convention. It's the largest one I've ever seen. And I have attended every state organization meeting that has ever been held in the state of Mississippi since I've been a union member, since 1946. And it has been a good one. 
and I think that uh, there's a lot of good work that has come out and I'm going to have to echo the same sentiments we have come a long ways and we've got a long ways yet to go if everybody will pull together I'm sure that we'll make the hill thank you thank you brother Bagham Before, before I recognize Brother Mike Bell, let me advise the board up here something. That Tom advised you all that we're going to meet in the green room, have lunch, have a short board meeting at 12.30. Has he told you that? All right, it's 12.30. You can go ahead if you want to and get your stuff together and meet us in the green room at 12.30, okay? That's why we had the, had the meeting the other day, same place, okay? All right. Okay, Chad, I recognize his brother, Mike Mann. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say that as a member of the state AFL-CIO, I appreciate the work that you and Tom Knight and the executive board and the author of our AFL-CIO is doing. I know you spent long hours up in the house lobbying up there, and those bills that we've got coming up means a lot to organized labor. I can remember back when... Our unemployment was just $20 a week, and we've come a long ways, and we're still going. And I just want to say I thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you. Let me, let me save this to you. I should have done this before the board left, but I was, and you heard the lieutenant governor say this yesterday, but I talked to Senator Perrin Purvis last night, and he is having a hearing in the old Supreme Court chambers at 2 o'clock on the workman's compensation bill. And he requested my presence, and I intend to be there. If any of you are still in town or from out of town, if any of you that are living in town would like to attend that hearing, I'd certainly like to request that you do so. 2 o'clock in the old Supreme Court chamber. Do we have any other delegates that would like to be recognized? If not, let me say once again, I think this has been one of our best conventions. And I now pronounce this convention adjourned sine die. Godspeed to all of you. <laughs>